How's it going guys? About a week ago, I put up a poll on my YouTube channel and asked people what they'd like to see next. Um, I gave five options. A uh, full video on roughing cuts, uh, which I, I touch base on pretty good in my last video. Um, there wasn't any commentary. It was just kind of raw, me doing what I was doing. Um, number two was a finishing cuts walkthrough. Um, spoon burnishing. A uh, closer look at my chopping block, because I've, I've gotten a lot of questions about that. And then 10 tips in 10 minutes. Um, and 38% of you uh, voted for spoon burnishing. So I'm going to do a video on that, and we'll delve right into it. So I've been complimented on the silky finish of my spoons for years. This is partly because I have plenty of experience uh, I use the sharpest tools and also because I use a decent uh, polymerizing oil on them and I choose to take an extra step when finishing my spoons. That step is burnishing. When done right, you can take what's a good finish and make it a great finish. This is three different woods. Uh, the one I'm holding now is ebonized cherry. The, the first one here was uh, birch, I believe and then black walnut. And just to give you an idea of what an unburnished spoon looks like, this is the same wood as this. These are both black walnut. Now mind you, this one has yet to have finishing cuts done on it um, or be oiled, but I mean, there's a pretty stark difference here. You don't see any light bouncing off of this one and this one's nice and shiny. So what is burnishing and what's the purpose? Uh, burnishing, as far as spoons go, it involves rubbing your finished spoon once it's dried and you've done all your finishing cuts and chamfering, um, rubbing it with a smooth object that's harder than the wood itself. And this is, this is a twofold objective that you're, that you're trying to achieve here. And one is that you want your spoon to look nice, of course. Um, the other is you want it to be more tactile, you want it to be more comfortable in the hand, but more importantly, you want it to be more comfortable when eating from it. Um, I've got plenty of spoons that are beautiful that do not have a good mouth feel. And just because of that, it's got that kind of sandpapery cat's tongue feel. Uh, just because of that, I don't use these spoons. Um, they're, they're plenty pretty to look at, but if, if it's not a comfortable spoon to use, I'm not going to use it. So, the purpose, the purpose of burnishing, I guess, would be to compress the wood fibers, which closes off the grain. Um, and ideally, this will create a smoother finish than you otherwise would have had on your spoon and will probably make you want to use the spoon more often. Sanding is something that some people enjoy doing, and I'm definitely not one of them. Um, first off, it creates a lot of wood dust, which is messy and can be harmful if breathed in. Um, but the biggest reason I don't sand my spoons is because it's not necessary for achieving the best finish on a spoon. And it also takes more time than burnishing. Sanding is something that a lot of people use to make up for their knife skills as well. They're like, oh, well, this spot isn't perfect, but it doesn't matter because I can sand it away and no one will ever know. Um, maybe you're asking how I know. Because the first couple months of spoon carving, that's what I did. I sanded my mistakes away. Um, and then I realized that it was more spoon carving for me, at least I can't speak for everyone is, is more about um, gaining and refining skills than it is about putting out the best looking spoon, you know, regardless of the method. Um, and again, that's just my opinion. That's not everyone's take on it. And and that's fine. But that's my reason for being in it. Um, so. I got tired of spending more and more time and effort sanding than actually carving spoons. And after a month or so of sanding, I decided to ditch the sandpaper and focus on my knife skills because personally, I like that to be the highlight of my work, but everyone's, or everyone's different and that's okay. Um, some people just want to put out a nice finished product um, and, and they want to do it in a way that they're familiar with, which might be, you know, an orbital palm sander. They might actually use that to do the the shaping on their spoon or a belt sander or, um, you know, just sandpaper by hand even. Um, and again, while that might be okay for some people, I, I don't enjoy it. Um, back in the day, I mean, this would have been, I started carving, I think in January, 2016. 
Um, I remember, you know, I might spend an hour and a half actually carving a spoon and then I might spend three, four hours sanding it. And it, it really, once I looked at what I was doing, it defeated the purpose for me. Um, so, you know, maybe you're one of those people that currently use sand and that's, again, that's okay. Um, but don't dismiss a different way of doing things. Um, and it's a simple way. It's not like there's a huge learning curve to it. And I'll, I'll go into more in this video about that. But um, don't just don't just let it pass you by. You know, take this opportunity to uh, to learn about it, to to see how simple it is, and to decide if you want to keep sanding or if you might want to ditch the sandpaper for a spoon and see how you do it, just a knife finish and uh, and some and some burnishing. Um, so we'll get further into this. So does burnishing matter? Um, it's not a requirement to carve a decent spoon. Um, you know, I, I haven't burnished every single spoon I've ever carved. I burnish them all now. Every, every spoon that, that leaves me and goes to a customer has been burnished. Um, that being said, it certainly makes spoons more enjoyable to use and to look at. Um, with a burnished surface, food particles aren't as prone to sticking to the wood surface. Um, so if you think about it like a nonstick frying pan, um, a pan with a porous surface causes food to stick to those pores, where a pan with a smooth surface and a proper finish allows you to cook without food sticking to the inside of the pan. Um, this is how closing off the pores in your wooden spoon and using a decent food safe polymerizing oil will give you the best results. And just to touch on that, um, there's a number of oils out there now that, that are good for spoons, but personally I would not use one that is not a polymerizing oil. And basically that just means that it turns into a food safe plastic over time. And there's things you can do to speed up the cure process on certain oils and stuff like that. But just to name a couple, um, tongue oil is good. Some people use tried and true. Uh, the Real Milk Pick Company puts out a really good one called Half and Half, and it's, uh, it's half tongue oil, half citrus. Um, but the primary oil that I use to finish my spoons is called Mah Mahoney's Walnut Oil. And I've been using it for years. It's not quite the same as every walnut oil out there. Um, it's the only one I know of that has kind of an expedited way of curing without any chemical additives that are, um, you know, bad for you. So it's safer, uh, you know, food contact and, um, and, and things like that. And there's, there's a little misconception about walnut oil, just to kind of go on a side topic that if you have a nut allergy, um, there, you might encounter problems using a spoon with walnut oil. And it's just, it's not true. Um, once it's polymerized, you are not ingesting any anyways. It, there's nothing going in your stomach, uh, you know, being digested. It's literally a, a, a plastic at that point. Um, so I, I don't know how else to dispel the myth that spoons that are finished with walnut oil are, are bad for people with nut allergies other than to say, do your homework. Um, don't just Google something and because someone's opinion, mine for example, said it is or isn't, look up studies if you're somebody with a, a, a food allergy or um, rather a nut allergy, look up studies that actually have science that, that back what they're saying, not just opinion-based stuff. Um, so that being said, uh, we'll move on to different objects that you can use to burnish with. So for these tips, I wanted to put it on screen so that you guys can maybe screenshot it, save it in your, your photo album on your phone or on your computers and have access to it at any given point. Um, you know, you could, you could print this if you decide to take a photo of this. You could print it up, have it with you, whatever you want. I just thought that this might be a, a good format that, that would, might make things easier for you guys to recall some of these tips because there's kind of a lot of them. Um, 
So I've used several things to burnish my spoons in the past, from glass marbles to ceramic burnishers that are made specifically for burnishing spoons, to smooth beach stones, to polished deer antler. Uh, whatever you choose to burnish your spoons with, though, keep in mind these guidelines. The object needs to be extremely smooth with no sharp edges. You don't want to scratch or damage the spoon that you just finished. Choose a material that is harder than the wood you're burnishing. If you want to burnish with a polished piece of non-porous hardwood, you can do so. Keep in mind, however, that you want to compress the fibers in your spoon, not compress the fibers in the tool that you're trying to burnish with. Now, this is important. Um, me, personally, I don't burnish with wood, but I've heard of people doing it. Like, if you have a cherry spoon and you've got, you know, a, a chunk of extremely hard hardwood that is highly polished, I've heard of people burnishing that way. I've never tried it, but I know several people have, so I, I wanted to put that in here. Um, use a decent amount of pressure when burnishing, but learn where the spoon needs to be supported while doing so. Brace it properly to protect it from possibly snapping under the pressure. This one's very, very important. Um, I've broken a couple spoons that were finished just by not supporting them underneath the neck while burnishing you know, certain parts of them. Um, it, it takes a good amount of pressure like I said, but you, you need to make sure that behind the material there is, there's plenty of support and your hand is the perfect tool to do that with. Um, this part, this is something that I suppose might be opinion based. I've seen people burnish 100% of the surface of their spoon and I don't necessarily do it that way. I do most of the surface. So kind of reading from the text here. Um, burnish every surface of your spoon except the chamfers. Chamfering is when you carve the sharp angles off your, the edges of your spoon, leaving crisp facets in their place. You want to avoid burnishing your chamfers so you don't leave them looking muted. And I've actually adapted certain grips that I'll show you later on in this video to make sure that I don't accidentally burnish over those chamfers. Um, and one of the reasons that that's important to me is that if you if you burnish all your chamfers, they're kind of pointless to begin with. The chamfers should highlight the precision in your cuts. Um, they should give you know a definitive outline to your spoon, um, and and kind of show off your skill. If you burnish over your chamfers, it really ends up looking like a sanded spoon and one that's poorly done. So. Um, Moving right along, stay away from anything that might react with the wood itself. For example, iron, which all steel is made from, is known to react with tannins and wood, causing it to blacken when there are two, when the two come in contact with each other. This is the same principle that is used to make iron acetate or ebonizing solution. So, as you've seen in the photo, I have a metal spoon here, um, and that is something that I know plenty of people will burnish with. The problem with a metal spoon, if I can show this on camera real quick, is that there are hard edges on it. Um, also, it's it's a pretty broad thing. It's maybe, what, an inch and a quarter wide here? You can't get that into any tight areas on a spoon, like at the neck, for example. Um, and I can't really see how you could burnish the entirety of the inside of the bowl with this. You might be able to use the back of the spoon just to do a handle or something like that, but I don't think that this would do as good of a job as say this or this or my personal favorite, a piece of antler. Um, and also that being said, with, with this spoon, uh, you know, spoons often say stainless on them. It'll say stainless china, as this one does right here. Um, but not all stainless is created equal either. So I don't have experience from this. It's just something I want to put out there that it is a possibility that if you're using something like walnut, this might leave black streaks on the spoon that you're burnishing if it's made out of walnut. I'm not positive, but I, I know it's 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 possible. Um Finally here, I've got make sure your hands are clean as well as your work surface and your burnishing tool before you begin burnishing. Any grime present can easily be transferred to your spoon and any dirt or debris can even cause scratches in the surface of the wood. I like to lay down a thick piece of leather, leather on the table to work on. If you don't have access to one, a clean hand towel will work just fine.
So to burnish or not to burnish, that is the question. Um, ultimately, it's your decision whether or not you want to burnish your spoons um, or sand them or, or do neither. All I can do is offer my suggestions on the best way that I know to get a great finish on a wooden spoon. Um, whatever your approach is, you know, just enjoy the journey and make some wood chips. It, it doesn't have to be, um, I'm not trying to force this opinion down your throat. Nobody should be getting into an argument over the right way to do it because again, the right way is the way that you enjoy or the way that works for you. Um, I'm just offering my experience as, as far as what, what my process is that I've developed over time that, that works for me. And obviously, as you can see, it works very well. So I will, uh, I will go into some video now on just showing you maybe some of the grips that I use when burnishing uh, proper handholds to, to support the spoon so you don't break it. Um, and, and then we'll, we'll close out the video with that. So I've got a bunch of tools here that can be used for burnishing and I'm going to pick this one here. These are ones that I sell in my Etsy shop. They're basically just polished mineral wands and they work really, really well. Um, again, Note that this is obviously harder than the material I'm trying to burnish. Um, and is there's no sharp edges. It's It's got rounded ends, which is really, really handy for this. Um, and also on another note, I want to, I want to, I want to tell you that this spoon is not finished. I have not done finishing cuts to this. I've not done chamfers. I literally just want to show you to even a piece of wood that is unfinished. Um, you know, this was roughed out while it was still wet. I want to show you the difference, the, the massive impact that burnishing can have on the surface of wood um, when done properly. So I'll bring it over to the edge here, which is something I, I consistently do, um, just to kind of, you know, reinforce support underneath the bowl. Um, and I basically just use this, and I'll keep my thumb behind the shoulder here. That way I cannot rub over that line, because I like these on my spoons to be defined ridges. So I keep my thumb there, that way I can't go too far. And again, this is this is not a finished spoon, so the, the surface of it is um, rather bumpy compared to one of my finished spoons. So this is not gonna be a perfect, um, you know, comparison between this spoon and the finished spoon that I have sitting next to me off camera. Something I like to do when I'm burnishing is make sure that I have generally light coming from one direction, which is a rule of thumb I use for finishing spoons, uh, doing finishing cuts on spoons rather, as well. Um, because it allows me to use that one source of light to help me play with angles and see where I've got high spots or, you know, in this case, what spots are burnished or, and what spots are unburnished. So I'm, I'm going overkill on this just because, like I said, I've got um, plenty of spots on it that are lumping, and I'm not able to really get my burnisher into those spots super well. But already, you can see how shiny that's become. And I'll go ahead and do this as if the spoon was finished and, and as if I'm burnishing the whole thing. Um, I'm going to hold it in my hand like this, basically. Let me turn to the side here. And right here behind the shoulders, I burnished that as well. Being, being sure not to run over this ridge with my burnisher. And I'll, again, keep my thumb there. That way I cannot go too far. And, you know, maybe I won't 100% burnish the spoon, but I'll give you the idea. coming up along the, the, some people call it the crown, but it's the, you know, the keel of the spoon. And then I'll lay it down like this, that way the entire handle is supported and I'm not putting pressure, you know, here and here, that way I can't snap it. And this spoon's pretty stout anyways, it's, it's fairly thick because it's unfinished, so it's not something I'm really worried about, but um, again, using a good amount of pressure, 
And if I had chamfers on this, I would be ensuring that I wasn't running over those chamfers. Like, so these hard edges right here would be chamfered. I would keep my burnisher absolutely straight with this plane. I wouldn't do it at an angle because I wouldn't want to crush those chamfers. So same thing over here. This is kind of an awkward grip, I suppose, but um, kind of reaching over the bowl and rubbing the back shoulders aggressively. Coming up on the keel, doing the opposite side of the handle now. And you can see this goes fairly quickly. This isn't, you know, like I spoke earlier about how it can take hours to sand a spoon to your liking. It doesn't take that long. This is a couple minutes. Um, from there, since I've done the back of the bowl, both the shoulders, I will do the top of the keel and the back of the handle. Rolling it around on the light so I can see what's been missed. Um, I also do the side of the, the bowl as well as the top rim once that's, uh, once that's finished up. And basically to start that, I go across both sides at the same time. And I just let this slip basically off the end. And I'll double check to see if I got it all. If I didn't, I'll come across the tip a little bit. And then I'll run it up the back of the, the bull's rim. Same thing as I did on the back of the handle. I'm making sure that the keel and the end of the handle are both supported. Or stable, rather. You don't want your workpiece moving around on you. And you don't want it snapping in half. So that's that. Now the inside of the bowl um, is a little more time consuming. And this is one of the reasons why you want to have something that has, you know, kind of a round ball end. Like this does. Like this does. Like this antler does. And even this little rock. And just to show you, it can be done with a rock as well. And this is not, this is not, you know, it's got some lumps to it, but it's very, very smooth, so it'll do the job. I will hold my finger at the edge of the bowl, that way I can't accidentally run over the champers. And I'll get reasonably close, but I'll do, you know, the majority of the inside of the bowl, the middle part, I suppose, um, pretty quickly and carelessly. But it's once I start approaching all these chamfers and edges that I start slowing it down and really, really be careful of, you know, where the, where the tip of the burnisher is at, or just the stone in this case. So again, moving my finger back here so that I can't roll over any of those beautiful chamfers that we're pretending exist. I generally take more time at the tip of the bowl just because I don't want to, again, roll that over and then make it look like my chamfers are um, muted or non-existent or just sloppy. Double checking. I missed a spot right here. So you can see how shiny that's become. And that is without oil, that is with no finishing cuts. And you can see right here on the neck a spot that I missed. So that shows you a pretty stark difference, I think. No shine in that spot whatsoever, but the rest of it is extremely shiny. And it just feels ridiculously smooth. So I just wanted to give you guys a quick little demo. Um, and we'll side to side this with a spoon that is finished. And as you can tell, this has had finishing cuts and all the details and chamfering done on it. This has had none of that, just burnishing. And they look pretty much the same. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope this has, uh, has helped, um, you know, dispel some myths maybe, uh, show you guys a different outlook if, if, if you've been someone who has been sanding. Um, 
And if you've got any questions, uh, again, re-reference that spot where I put the tips. Uh, take a screenshot of it. And as always, I would appreciate you throwing me a like. Um, shoot me a comment and just say hey if you want to. Uh, or sub to my channel if you're not already. Take it easy, guys.